All right, today we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 7, start with verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you, then though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give, give good gifts to those who ask? So in everything do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Let's go to God. Pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you've made. We thank you for the blessing you've given us. God, as we come to you in prayer today, we just pray that guidance and direction be upon us for your sermon, to understand your word, and to give me words of wisdom to explain it accurately. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The passage we're looking at here, Jesus is teaching us that we are dependent upon God for our needs. He tells us to ask, to seek. And that God knows how to give us good gifts. If we ask for a piece of bread, God's not going to give us a rock. If we ask for a fish, He's not going to give us a snake or a scorpion. He knows how to give good gifts to His children. However, just because we ask God for something doesn't mean He's going to give it to us exactly what we ask in the way that we want it. And also... Sometimes our attitude is not right before the Lord. Even when we do ask for something and God gives us something, sometimes it's our attitude that is wrong. It's our attitude that needs to be adjusted. This week we have something that we call Thanksgiving. Where we're supposed to give thanks to God for what God has given us. But what's our real attitude? How do we approach God during this day of thanks? Do we show an attitude of thanks and gratitude? Or do we just grumble and complain? Today I want us to take a look at a group of Israelites that should have had the best attitude towards God of any people in Scripture because God rescued them from slavery in Egypt. However, we will see that their attitude was not always good. In fact, the scripture says that they grumbled. They were not grateful for God's provisions. And this attitude would eventually cost them very dearly. So what are we talking about? What did God do for them? What was it that God did for the Israelites during their wilderness? We're going to look at this by looking at Exodus chapter 16. In Exodus chapter 16, we see how God provided for his people in the wilderness. The whole Israelite community set out for Elam and came to the desert Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt, in the desert the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you brought us out into this desert to starve. This entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are going to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way I will test them and see whether they will follow my instruction. <coughs> On the sixth day they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You know that it was the Lord when He gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because He has heard your grumbling against Him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, 
but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole community, Israelite community, they looked towards the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat in the morning. You will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, then flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Each one is to gather as much as he needs. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they, uh, when they measured it by the omer, he gathered much. He who gathered much did not have too much. And he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. Then Moses said to them, No one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Each morning everyone gathered as much as he needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, This is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake, and boil what you want to boil. Save what is left until left, and keep it until morning. So they saved it until morning, as Moses commanded. And it did, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where he is on the seventh day. No one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was a light, a white, like cordon seed, and tasted like wafers made with honey. Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it for the generations to come, so that they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the desert when I when you when I brought you out of Egypt. So Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it. Then place it before the Lord to keep it for generations to come. As the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put manna in a tent of testimony that may be kept. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years until they came to a land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. An omer is one-tenth of an ephah. I want us to notice that this generation, the Israelites grumble after being saved from the Egyptians. So they go out. And by the way, it just was a couple months. Just a couple months after they came back. In fact, that's the exact quote, I believe, in um, verse 16. Um, on the 15th day of the second month. In two months, they began to grumble against the Lord. They didn't ask God for help. They didn't seek God in prayer. They just started complaining. Oh Lord, why did you bring us out into this desert? We'd have been better off if you would have killed us in Egypt. Remember how we were in Egypt? We had all the food that we wanted. We ate meat. Oh yeah, we got beat. We, we were enslaved. But we had food. Look what you're doing to us, God. It was as if, in their mentality, God owed them after he had saved them. 
What did you think about that? After God rescued them from slavery, their attitude was almost like, God, you owe us. You know something I find interesting about this passage? The Israelites did eat, but we never read how they, were, how they thanked God for this meal. Go back and reread the passage. They complained to God, told him they were going to die, but find a place where they actually said, thank you. Now, I'm not saying they didn't say it, we just don't have it recorded. I mean, if God's going to give the entire Israelite community, millions of people, this free bread to eat, you would think the least they could have done was have a community thanksgiving. But they didn't. Or at least not that we read. Were they thankful? Or were they simply satisfied? Well, that could be two different things. We are often just satisfied, but never really have an attitude of thanksgiving. Which were they? And by the way, some of the Israelites still didn't trust God as they continued to collect manna when God told them not to. God was very specific about his instructions. He told them exactly how much to take every day. And then on the sixth day, they were to collect twice as much and not go out on the Sabbath. They broke both rules. Some collected more than they were supposed to. Some went out to try to find some on the Sabbath. They showed a lack of faith and trust in God for what he was doing for them. No trust. No faith. Where did the Israelites start off bad? Well, my opinion is they started with a bad attitude. Where you start is usually where you're going to finish. When we start off with a bad attitude, we're going to finish with a bad attitude. I was recently reading uh, this week, somebody talked about the fact, you ever, you ever wonder why people wake up in a bad mood? Usually because they went to bed with a bad mood. Where we start is where we're going to finish. If we start with a bad attitude, we're going to finish with a bad attitude. If we start with a positive attitude, we have a better chance of finishing with a positive attitude. Our attitude will make a difference. It is the way we see the world. Your attitude will determine how you see your life. The Israelites started off with a bad attitude. They finished with one. So here's the question I got when we talk about our thanksgiving, what we're thankful for. Do we make our request to God with the right attitude? Oh, God, you owe me. Oh, no, he doesn't. God doesn't owe you a thing. And if you have this mentality that God owes you, you're wrong. Everything he gives you is a gift. The Israelites had that attitude. Oh, God, you took us out of our, our homes where we had all this food to eat. They were slaves. They're Slave owner wanted to kill them. What's our attitude when we ask God for something? Do we realize we're just one small aspect of His universe and that we are taking, talking to a great king? You're not talking to an equal, and you're not talking to your magic genie. You're talking to the God of heaven and earth. Well, did the Israelites ever improve their attitude? Let's find out. I told you they started off with a negative attitude. I wonder where it concluded. Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 through 35. We see here in the book of Numbers, this time of testing and how often the Israelites failed in this test. 
So we come up here to verse 4. The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again the Israelites started wailing and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and garlic. Now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. The manna was like a corn seed. It looked like raisin. The people went around gathering it and ground it in a hand mill or crushed it in like mortar. They cooked it in a pot or made it into cakes. It tasted something made with olive oil. When the dew settled on the camp at night, the manna also came down. Moses heard the people of every family wailing, each at the tent of his, each at the entrance of his tent. The Lord became exceedingly angry. Moses was troubled. He asked the Lord, Why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put this burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their forefathers? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me. Give us meat to eat. Can I carry all these people by myself? The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you are going to treat me, put me to death right now. If I have found favor in your eyes, do not let me face my own ruin. The Lord said to Moses, Bring me seventy of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. You have them come to the tent of meeting. They may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there. I will take on the spirit that is on you and put the spirit on them. They will help you carry the burden of the people so that you will not carry it alone. Tell the people, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. The Lord heard you when you walked well. If only we had meat to eat. We were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat. You will eat it. You will not eat it for just one day or two or five ten or twenty, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you love it because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have well before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? But Moses says, here I am among 600,000 men on foot and you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month? Would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? The Lord answered Moses, Is the Lord's arm too short? You now see whether or not what I say will come true for you. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him. And he took the spirit that was on him and put the spirit on the seventy elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. However, two men, whose names were Ebed and Mebed, had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but did not go to the tent. The spirit of the Lord rested on them. And they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Elad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since his youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Then Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Now a wind went out from the Lord and drove quail from the sea. It brought them down around the camp to about three feet above the ground as far as a day's walk in any direction. All oh, that day and night and the next day the people went out and gathered quail. No one gathered less than ten omers. 
Then they spread them out along, around the camp. While the meat was still between their teeth, and before they could consume, the anger of the Lord burned against the people, and he struck them down with a severe plague. Therefore, the place has been called Kibrath Hathabe, because they buried the people who had craved other food. From Kibrath Hathabe, the people traveled from Harris and stayed there. It started with just a few grumblers that rabble, if you will. Then it spread to every family. And even Moses complained. See, grumbling is contagious. Once one person starts to complain and be negative, if it's not stopped, will spread. People could come in a very good mood. But when one person starts to start complaining, guess what? Well, if you can find something wrong with your life, guess what I can find? Well, I can find something wrong with my life, too. We can make it a little contest. We can see which one of us is actually more miserable. That's how grumbling works. I'm upset, and everybody else has got to be upset just right along with me. It's contagious. And it will go through the entire group of people like a virus. <laughs> Israel thought that their oppressors provided better than a loving God. The Egyptians looked at Israel <coughs> probably of lower standard than their cattle. Because their cattle probably live better. But Israel looked at the situation and said, Well, God, when we lived in Egypt, we had fish at no cost. I, I don't know that you can say that your slavery was not a cost. That fish came at your blood, sweat, and tears as you were being whipped and everything else. Your oppressors didn't care more than God. They remembered the food that they had. But we're not looking at what God is giving them. You may have said, well, God was giving them bread. Yet in that time period, bread was the essential of the meal. He was giving them the very basic of what they needed to live on each day. And it was unique. You were giving a blessing. Okay, when you get into to Israel, you could eat all those vegetables and fish that you wanted. But God was giving you something special. It was a blessing to get the bread from heaven. That nobody else in all of human history would ever get to eat. Are you like me? Aren't you just a tad bit curious what the manna would have tasted like? Wouldn't you be a tad bit curious to know what it would be like? To receive bread that came down from heaven? Wouldn't that be a blessing? Okay, let's forget the turkey and the gravy and the cranberries and all that this week. Let's just say that God provided us a special meal coming down out of heaven. A once in a lifetime opportunity. Wouldn't that be something? They didn't want to look at it that way. It was... Do you remember the good old days that really wasn't so good? <coughs> oh, we had all this food. We just got beat on a daily basis. And we had our lives threatened. But man, we had fish. Now I want you to notice something that the grumbling did. The negative attitude did. To Moses, dead, uh, excuse me, doubt set in during Moses' negative attitude. I do feel sorry for Moses. I don't know what it was like to deal with those people on a daily basis. As a human being, I would say Moses probably has about a hundred times more patience than me. Because at some point, I would have left in the middle of the night and ran away. But did you notice what happens here? Moses... He hears the complaining. He hears the grumbling. 
It gets contagious. So now he's like, well, God, how in the world are you going to feed all these people? We don't have enough food here. Now notice this. What did Moses see back in Israel just a few months ago? He saw how God multiplied the frogs. He saw how God could change a river into blood. He saw how God could bring the locusts. He saw how God could bring the hell. He saw how God could kill the firstborn of every family in Egypt. <coughs> Did he really? Th and he's been watching how God provided manna from heaven every single day except for the Sabbath. Why in the world would he think it would be such a challenge for God to bring the quail? You know why? Because that's how negative attitude affects the brain. It's like a switch in your brain. And when that negative negativity or when that depression sets in, you don't believe anything good can happen. You start to doubt God's blessings. You start to have that doubt that there's anything good in life. It switches. Like you'd go over and switch a light and turn all these lights off. Of all the people in Scripture, Moses knew God could do this. But when we decide to live in negativity, when we decide to live in nothing good happens, we decide to live like, you know how the child plays peekaboo? With our eyes covered. And you can't see. You have to be willing to take the hands off the eyes and see the truth. Our mental and emotional attitude will determine whether we praise God or complain about the gift He gave us. Your mental and emotional attitude will determine your focus. You know, when I woke up this morning, I had a choice to make. And I, I, I look around here and I see a lot of people have this same choice. I put my contacts in my eyes. Now, if you happened to be on the road the same time I was driving, you were glad that I did. Because I could have chose to keep my contacts out my glasses off. I could have chose to try to drive like that. If that's how I wanted to see the world, if I took my contacts out right now, you guys would all be blurry faces to me. You can determine whether that's an improvement or not. Not me, okay? If I wanted to see the world like that, I can. I have that choice because of my eye condition. You have a choice of whether you want to live in a negative attitude that makes everything blurry or to put your glasses and contacts on and see the world through a different light. No one controls your attitude. You do. I fundamentally reject the idea when you say somebody made me mad. Because you're giving power over to somebody else. And they may have done something that angers you. But you have the choice of how you react to somebody else. Nobody else can take that choice from you. How do you want to see the world? You choose it. <clears throat> How you see the world will already determine the amount of things you give God. This Thursday, Thanksgiving, people will look at it and say, well, I've had this sickness, or I've had this accident, or I've had this, this death that's happened in this world, or I've had this financial problem, or I've had all of these other problems. Okay. How can I have an attitude of thanks. You will determine it by how you choose to look at life. You have that choice. 
Well, what did, why did God do this for Israel? You know, one of the things I was always just kind of curious about, God could have chosen to do anything in the wilderness He wanted to. Do you ever wonder why God chose to do the things that He did? There are times when God does tell us His reason. He tells us that in Deuteronomy chapter 8, starting with verse 1. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today, so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert those 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep His commands. He humbled you casting you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Stop right there. Does that sound familiar? Should. It's the exact same words Jesus told Satan. God is teaching them. Your clothes did not wear out. And your feet did not swell during those 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valley and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce, and where you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron, and you can dig copper out of all out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God failing to observe His commands, His laws, and His decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, all you have is multiplied, then your hearts will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that thirsty and waterless land, with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you out of a hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known. The humble and test, so that you, in the end, might go well with you. You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hand have produced this wealth for me. Remember the Lord your God, for He gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms His covenant, which He swore to your forefathers as, to, as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed, like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you have been destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. God teaches us something here. God uses some of our life experiences to teach us valuable lessons for our own good. In this passage, He is telling Israel, the reason I provided the manna, the reason I allowed this to happen in the desert, was to teach you, to be able to humble you, to teach you to be dependent upon the commands of God, so that you would learn to trust me in all things. He is teaching them every single day for those 40 years to trust Him, to believe Him, to know that He is going to do good. God sometimes does that for us. God sometimes uses our life experiences to teach us something for our good. He will never do anything that is bad to us in the long run. 
It may sound, may feel bad in the short term, but not in the long run. Here's the problem. Sometimes we do not learn the focus that God is teaching us. Sometimes we do not learn the lesson that God is teaching us because of our focus. The eyes feed the heart and the mind. And if we don't want to see something, we won't. When we focus on the negativity, we will always fail to see what God is doing in our lives and how God can do something good for us. We should give God thanks during our times of testing and our trials because God is working for our good even if we cannot see it. You know what I like about Thanksgiving the most? I didn't appreciate the holiday when I was younger. I'll, I'll be honest with you, I really didn't. Not, not until probably the last 10 years or so did I really start to appreciate Thanksgiving because I started studying more of its history. And this is why I determined, if you go back and you, you study Thanksgiving in our history, what you will discover is that the biggest trials and biggest testings that we had as a country almost inevitably coincide with the Thanksgiving holiday. The first national Thanksgiving was during the Revolutionary War when it didn't look like we were winning. Thanksgiving became a yearly observation during the Civil War. It, it had its firm date set during the Great Depression and during World War II. And if you keep digging further, you, you, you see all these interesting things that, that it was when we were down that we could look up and thank God because we were then humbled. And I often hear people say, how can I give thanks when there's so much is going wrong in my life? And I say, this is the time to do it. You have been humble. Look up. Take away that negative attitude and see what God has given. Give thanks to God even if you don't feel like it. Change your perspective in life. In your bullet. You guys all should have a little card in there. If you didn't get one, we've got some extra out here. And I believe it says something like, I give thanks to God for the manna of. You see, Israel couldn't see the blessing of the manna because of their negative attitude. They didn't see how this trial was for their good. Every year at Thanksgiving, we list off everything that's good. Here's, here's a challenge. Reshape your vision. Think about something that was a challenge for you this year. Something that maybe while you were going through it wasn't positive. Think about something that maybe even was hurtful. And see how you can thank God for it. So, to tell you the truth, I, I started doing this the other night when I wrote this sermon. So the first thing I thought of, because it's been driving me batty, and my wife will tell you it's been driving me batty, and it's been, in turn, me driving her batty, if she's honest. When I got the debt and stuff from student loans and stuff like that, it just trying to figure out how to pay back. And, it, and what it actually forced me to do was take some side work and some jobs that I didn't know I could do. Maybe thought I might try, but it stretched me. And it improved me as a person. I think in many ways it improved me as a minister. It has improved me as a teacher in all these ways. And I never would have been stretched 
had I never had to deal with my problem. I never ever thank God for that. Because in my negativity, I viewed something that was a problem. Instead of seeing how God could work in my life to teach me a lesson. Over the past few years, my wife and I have not been able to have a baby. We've tried and it's been heartbreaking. A lot of you guys know the story. It's not easy to talk about, so I'm going to make this quick. During those trials, I've learned more about my God that I never learned before. I learned more about grace in ways I never thought I would learn before. And I learned to help a friend who was going through the exact same problem. It's not something I ever wanted to thank God for. But I see how it could work as a blessing. This week, you may not be able to write it down now, you may not be able to think about it, and that's fine. Think about what your personal manna is. What trial, what type of testing, what struggle did God put in your life so that you could learn? And you may not want to give thanks for it. But here's your choice. Keep looking at it as a negativity and let it drive you into the ground until you become a, just a very negative person and refuse to change. Turn it into a positive because God can work all things to the good of those who believe. And see how God can take what you believe is negative and make it a positive. Are your glasses on or off? Is your contacts in your eyes or out? Do you prefer to look at the world like this? Or will you take the hands down? Are you thankful for the manna that God has given you today. The challenge for Thanksgiving, the challenge for you this week, is to reshape how you view your life. Not the negativity, not looking at it as horrible, but looking at how God carried you through and learn to trust in Him. And if you're going to trust in Him, the biggest thing you can trust in Him for is your salvation. Because there is no other way on heaven or earth to be saved except through the blood of Jesus Christ. Are you thankful that God sent His Son to die for you? Today, if you are, you can confess Him as your Lord and Savior, repent of your sins, be baptized for forgiveness of your sins. If you need to make a decision, you can make it now. So we stand and sing our invitational hymn, hymn 58.